um, because he took all the information that we gave him and shared with him uh, when he was getting started and ran with it. So he not only is a great artist, but he's also great at marketing. And so uh, that said a lot about his success uh, in his career. So I want to commend him for that and his ongoing uh, role model for uh, the other artists. Also want to thank him for all he's done for SKB um, in his support. And in 2018, we awarded him the Rose Award. Um, and as you all know, unless you're new uh, to SKB, this is our special award for those folks who have gone over and beyond the call of duty. And so I thank him for that. So um, I don't want to waste any more time, although I could bragging about Andrew. He's special to me and he's special um, to SKB. So with that said, Andrew, I turn this over to you. Well, thank you so much, Pam. That's a, a lovely uh, introduction. And uh, uh, SKB really is, you know, a, a part of my family. And I'm just uh, really grateful for all the, the help and mentorship that I've had over the years and for the opportunity that it's given me to, to, to help and mentor um, others. That's, uh, you know, I've been teaching um, since I was 13 years old. I started teaching art classes for little kids in the back room of an art store when I was still in junior high school. And, uh, you know, I always tried to be the art teacher that I wished I had. Um, and I have had some amazing art teachers, but I've also had some really bad ones. And, uh, you know, I consider it one of the great privileges of my life to, to be able to do my best to be a, a, a good um, teacher to, to others, whether it's about marketing, whether it's about art practice itself, uh, it really doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's something that um, I'm very, very grateful for. Um, and SKB is a great... Um, uh, tool to allow me to, to do that for a broader audience, which is why when I got that email saying who wants to give a presentation on Zoom, I said, oh, absolutely, I'll do it. Um, and then, of course, about five minutes later, I said, oh, God, I'm drowning in work. Why did I agree to this? Like, I'm, <laughs> I've got to do a presentation, but, uh, but I'm really glad to be doing it. So uh, I'm going to start by um, giving you a, a quick little tour of the studio. I'm going to I'm going to move the iPad slowly because I don't want to make anyone seasick. But uh, basically, uh, I bought this house. We moved from California from a tiny little house to Tucson, Arizona, um, traded our 828 square feet for uh, uh, 2,680 square feet. And the biggest part of that was having a much, much bigger studio, which is important because I share that with my partner, Guy Coombs. So here's some of Guy's in progress work here. Um, and uh, I'll kind of take you through some of the things I'm working on right now, and then I've got a little presentation that I'm going to give. Um, so, uh, is this not in focus? Is it doing a weird focus thing? There, there we you go. go. That looks better. I don't know why I was doing that. So, uh, so th these are a couple pieces that I've just finished, which are um, set to be in a show coming up in Jackson Hole pretty soon. Um, uh, I'm, I've always been very fond of rabbits. But that's what this guy is. And then this is part of my so-called string theory series, which I'll talk about a bit more um, later on. Um, some of you are familiar with my totem series. Um, this is a study of uh, bobcats stacked on top of a saguaro cactus uh, that I'm working on. That's an in progress. Um, this is a, uh, uh, the raven down there, which is just um, barely getting started, is gonna be for um, Western Visions coming up uh, this year. So uh, our studio is lovely. It looks out on the pool. You can see our, our pool guy, um, also <laughs> this guy Coombs, hard at work. Um, <laughs> he's saying hello. Um, so uh, these are some other pieces that are uh, in the works right now. Um, this is another uh, totem piece, stacked magpies. Um, and that's a, a piece that um, I'll probably be finishing this week. Um, I just finished this little um, cougar cub painting. That's called Opening Night. Uh, and then uh, this is my first ever bear painting. It's a big uh, 30 by 40 of a uh, black bear called Looking Up. Um, so those are some of the things that are happening right now in the studio. Um, what I want to do is uh, give you this little presentation, which is going to talk a bit about, um, you know, what I do and a uh, little bit about how my career started, and, and, but it's going to focus on the series of paintings that I've been working on for about the last three to four years. 
Um, and then I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to do a demo um, and uh, I'm going to focus on some of these mixed media studies that I've been doing, which some of you may have seen on Facebook. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that uh, later on, but it's been my solution to uh, make a little bit of money with all of my galleries closed down. Uh, but it's also turned into a really, really fun exercise in doing some spontaneous work. So um, I've got two little pieces in progress and I'm gonna do a demo of those and that'll probably take us uh, through our time. Um, and uh, so let me um, go ahead then and I'm going to switch over to my laptop and get started on this presentation. Oops. Don't need audio, thank you. Bear with me for one second. Doing good so far. Okay. So those who know me know that I'm not the most technological person. Ah, there we go. Okay. So, um, oh, that's me. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about a little bit is uh, the work that I do, but through the lens specifically of um, contemporary wildlife art. So um, this is uh, sort of based on a lecture I actually gave at the um, National Museum of Wildlife Art um, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is sort of uh, my work as an artist within this specific context. So, um, you know, Obviously, wildlife art, you know, we can go back to Paleolithic cave paintings, but I'm going to start from a standpoint of sort of wildlife art in the Americas really begins with science illustration. Um, and it progresses into sporting art. Uh, and from there, it progresses into this sort of ecologically minded, um, uh, highly representational art of the um, 80s through early 2000s, typified by people like John Sri Lester, Robert Bateman, Terry Isaac. Um, and eventually, uh, and, and but what's interesting about um, all of these various forms of wildlife art is that they all have some kind of documentarian aspect to them. And uh, there's a narrative, but it's very typically a natural history narrative. And um, a lot of people wonder why wildlife art gets a bad rap and why this sort of, you know, high end art world turns up its nose at it. And I think this is a lot of the reason why. And it's unfortunate and it's unfair. Um, because just because something has, a, has a, a narrative to tell that's about the world around us doesn't mean that it's not important. Um, but I think that it, it, it's, it's not an excuse, but it is an explanation that, um, you know, somehow it's, it's not deep enough, it's not introspective enough, it's all about looking externally to the world and describing what you see, and that's just not enough to keep uh, some people interested. Um, but throwing paint at a canvas apparently is. Um, so we could talk all day about that. But, um, but what's interesting to me is that, you know, when I started, um, the gallery that I was with um, in uh, Lafayette, California, um, was, uh, you know, represented all of those big names in, in wildlife art in the uh, 80s and 90s. And so that's very much the paradigm in which I started. But over the years, I started introducing other elements into my work, and uh, my work took on a decidedly contemporary uh, aspect. So when we talk about contemporary wildlife art, um, obviously we're all contemporary because we're live. What I'm speaking of specifically is wildlife art that allows for the admittance of abstraction, uh, wildlife art that uh, allows for um, the exploration of stylization, um, and uh, nature art that uh, deals with uh, concepts like flatness and pattern. Uh, things like non-objective space and color. And these are all concepts that are, uh, that are not specific to any particular type of art, but that have been generally over the years sort of excluded from wildlife art um, until, I mean, at the time that I started, um, I could count on one hand the number of artists besides me who were introducing quote unquote contemporary art elements into their work. Um, a few of them are artists I knew through SKB, like Mort Solberg. Um, and, uh, and then the other issue is um, a focus on concept and concept beyond describing the animal that you see. 
And again, I don't use the term beyond describing what you see to say that describing what you see isn't enough. It absolutely can be. It's just that for in, within the contemporary context, there's oftentimes another narrative that has more to do with the making of the art, more to do with some uh, philosophical uh, concept, um, not just um, here's an animal. Um, this is an example of a piece that I did that has a very long and very involved narrative uh, behind it. Um, so, um, my start began at Pacific Wildlife Galleries in Lafayette, California. Um, at the time, they represented kind of all the big names in American wildlife art and, uh, and also abroad. Um, we had an annual show for uh, or every couple of years for Carl Brenders, for Bob Bateman, uh, Terry Isaac, John Street Lester, Jorge Mile. Um, this was also the gallery that had the only solo exhibition for Ray Harris Ching in North America ever. Um, so, I mean, there was, I was in some amazing company and I was very fortunate to be able to meet and learn from all of these artists. Um, speaking of, you know, great mentors, um, John Street Lester and Bob Baton in particular became uh, really important to me. Um, and uh, I started showing up at that gallery with my portfolio clutched earnestly under my arm when I was 13. And by the time I was 16, I was hanging work there. Um, and uh, of course, given the way that I started and the kind of role models I had, my early work, this is just an example, was definitely of that animal in an environment behaving naturally that really typifies most of late 20th century um, wildlife art. Um, but gradually I started to become a bit more experimental. And uh, this series, which is called Resurrection of Flight, was a real game changer for me. What had happened was I was in college and I was asked to do a knife painting. I had never done a knife painting before. I've always been an implied rather than an applied textualist. I don't tend to chunk on paint. Um, and uh, so it was a new experience for me. I hated it. Uh, but at the time we had been encouraged to spend a lot of time crafting our own canvases and I didn't want to throw the canvas away just because I had gooped all this paint on it. So I thought, well, how do I turn a thick goopy canvas into a smooth canvas again? And I thought, I know, I'll put a whole bunch of coats of gesso on this to fill in all the cracks and valleys and then I'll sand the whole thing down to even out the surface and I'll end up with a usable canvas that I can paint something on again. But what happened is that when I did that, all these wonderful abstract textures and patterns started emerging from this matrix as I sanded it down. And um, I thought, wow, that's really cool. So for several years, anytime I did a painting that I really didn't like, I would take whatever odds and ends of leftover paint I had in film canisters and half dried out palettes and I'd smear it all over the board, cover it with a few coats of gesso after it had dried, sand it down and sort of whatever abstract shapes that gave me um, would become the basis for a painting into which I would incorporate a bird typically. Um, and over the years that became sort of, um, whoops, what just happened? Uh, damn it. There we go. Sorry, push the wrong button. Uh, over the years that became sort of uh, typical of my style. Um, this was a real game changing piece for me. Uh, I forget what year this was. It may have been 2004, or I think it was 2004. Um, this was the first time that I allowed for that stylism and abstraction to not just be confined to the background, but to actually bleed into the animal subjects themselves. Um, so you can see in this close up that the tail of the peacock kind of dissolves into these stylistic shapes and there's a lot of sort of deliberately unfinished areas. Um, and uh, over time, I started getting to a point where this notion of building up thick layers of paint, coating over them with gesso and then sanding them down just kind of became my thing. And it's something I always tell people, you know, artists are constantly being pressured. I certainly was, because for many years, my work was incredibly diverse. Um, I was doing everything from super traditional paintings to very modern paintings and everything in between. I was doing some watercolor, some pencil, some acrylic, you know, I was just doing everything. Um, I was doing pastel. I just was not allowing myself to be pigeonholed, which I think was a really good experience. But I always got people saying like, well, what's your signature style? And uh, it was Bob Bateman actually who gave me the advice, your signature style will emerge from all the experimentation you do. You cannot rush it, just wait. And I still will never forget in 2008 when I hung my last show at Pacific Wildlife Galleries, I stood back from the, that show, which I had developed over the course of two years. And I just thought, wow, every one of these paintings has this 
put That's on right. the thick paint and sand it down thing. I just, you know, I, had, I, I hadn't tried to do that, it just happened. Um, so that's, that's what I always tell people about your signature style. It'll, it'll develop when it's ready to develop. So um, a little bit about the kind of concept and thought behind some of what I do. Um, all of my work of the last about 10 years has one thing in common, which is a, uh, which is a focus on um, uh, the notion of the contrast between um, illusionism and flat decorative treatments. So basically, the uh, history of art from the mid-late 1800s into the uh, 20th century is mostly about this question. Uh, is the canvas a window or is it a wall? Do we treat the canvas or board as a space that we can credibly enter into with depth and perspective? Or do we treat it as a flat surface to be decorated? And the first glimmers of this battle happening within the art world um, occur um, with Manet. Uh, this is his uh, famous Luncheon on the Grass uh, from 1862. And there's just, you know, the perspective is deliberately distorted. Um, having seen this piece at the Museo d'Orsay in Paris, it's even more dramatic in person. The black coats of the gentlemen are like, they look like cardboard cutouts. They're very flat. The front lighting on the seated nude in the, in the foreground or middle ground is, you know, makes her almost like a cardboard cutout relief. Um, it's, it, it, it's definitely deliberately playing with and distorting our perception of depth, which of course at the time was viewed by a lot of critics as just utter incompetence, but it was actually very calculated on, on Manet's part. And this becomes even more dramatic uh, not many years later. Um, this is uh, the Red Studio by Matisse from 1911. And what fascinates me about this piece, Matisse being very much inspired by Persian miniatures, he's playing around with the notion of what happens when uh, I mean, there's, there's nods to perspective loosely in here, the way that the tables and chairs are drawn, the perspective of the room, but everything is rendered utterly flat by the unifying force of a single color, in this case, the red, uh, that, that kind of flattens everything into almost like a wallpaper-like um, treatment. So with these ideas in mind, I started thinking about um, how I could play with that tension. Because here I was, a wildlife artist painting very detailed animals, but also painting abstraction, which is effectively flat. How do I merge those two? So um, early on, um, one of my um, uh, favorite forms of art are the American trompe l'oeil um, still life painters. This is one of uh, William Harnett's many after the hunt. Uh, pieces is from 1884. Um, there are many others, uh, John F. Pato, John Haberley, um, who did similar work. Um, and what I found really fascinating about these pieces is that the hallmark of the trompe l'oeil still life is a very shallow depth of field. Because obviously, you know, you walk past a painting that's a very realistic landscape. You don't really believe that you're staring out a window. But these pieces hung on walls of pubs and um, restaurants were so credibly like somebody had just come back from a hunt that there's a very famous instance of a, of a, a bar patron damaging one of Harnett's pieces by jabbing a cane at it because he didn't believe that it was a painting. He thought he was actually looking at the things hanging on the wall. Um, so, uh, and of course this is, you know, photography exists at this time, but not like this. So this kind of uh, more than photographic realism was really revolutionary. But what struck me as ironic is that because of that shallow depth of field, many of these paintings take on the form of things hanging on a door, things on a wall. John F. Pato's letter rack series, where it's like a bulletin board with little letters taped to it or, or, or stuck to it. And which means that part of their con convincing us of credible depth in real three-dimensional space is the careful painting rendering of a surface. And I thought that that was a really interesting conundrum. So I just, so I thought to myself, well, what's more of a flat surface than an abstract painting? And what happens if I do a trompe l'oeil still life on top of an abstract painting? Which yielded a whole series of work for me. This is a, a detail of a much larger painting called Mine Is. Uh, which was the largest still life I ever did. It's a 24 by 48. Um, and uh, I'm playing with that notion of the abstract background, which is a painting, but the objects layered on top of it and um, you know, asserting the surface by having there be cast shadows across that painting. Um, but then of course those cast shadows are an illusion as well. So it's this uh, constant sort of back and forth um, sort of toying with perception.
Um, and then uh, uh, that idea goes even further with this series. This is part of my modern camouflage series. I think this is the fourth one. And uh, this idea came to me very suddenly, just kind of one day I just had this really vivid image of owls emerging from wallpaper. Um, and it took me about two years to figure out in my head how I wanted to do it. And the challenge was I thought, well, if I've got a completely flat abstract background and I'm trying to have these owls interact with it, like how do I bridge that gap? How do I do that? And what I realized was that the less that I did, the better, because that's the whole point. So you have, uh, and of course these pieces have thought process behind them. They're very much about you know, the dislocation of wildlife from natural habitats to unnatural habitats, the integration of animals into the um, urban and suburban landscape. Um, but they're also very much about that battle in the late 1800s uh, into the 20th century of is the canvas a window or a wall? So you can see here in this close up that just this very subtle suggestion of a shadow allows us to believe that the owl is perching on something that if you hold your hand up in front of the screen and get the owl out of the way, the surrounding areas look completely and entirely flat. Um, and that's very much the point um, of these pieces. Um, so it creates this really wonderful tension, I think, between um, the uh, decorative and the illusionistic. And that's a, 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 um, a series that continues to this day. So um, speaking of, of uh, flatness, um, but also the influence of pop culture, um, funnily enough, I'm actually not a fan of pop art. Um, I've never been a big Andy Warhol fan, but um, it's a great example of how by immersing yourself in art and art history, you can find inspiration in places that you wouldn't necessarily have thought that you would. Um, so uh, this is uh, a Wayne Tebow. Um, sorry, I couldn't find a date for this piece, but it's uh, sometime in the 60s or 70s. Um, but, uh, you know, both of these artists dealt with this notion of pattern and repetition, regimentation, um, commercialization, uh, and funnily enough, these are things that I think are highly relevant when we talk about wildlife today and our dislocation from the natural world, which is weirdly combined with an omnipresence of the same. So, um, you know, these are just examples of different logos. Um, you know, all around us, we use animals and animal imagery uh, in, in, in a way that is actually very symbolic and totemic. You know, we, we identify with uh, puma for its speed, um, with, um, I mean, it's no, you know, uh, there's the, the Playboy bunny is on there. I mean, you know, rabbits breed. So, you know, isn't that ironic that that's the Playboy logo? Um, you know, there's, there's always, uh, you know, World Wildlife Fund is a panda. It's, you know, emblematic, uh, instantly recognizable of endangered species. So we're always using animals um, in, a, um, in a very um, uh, present way in our lives, even though so few people really have a deep and abiding connection with nature, certainly on a regular basis. Um, and even the apps on our phone, um, you know, th there, there are those that, uh, you know, Twitter um, is a little bird. Um, there's, uh, there's, but, it, but it illustrates something. There's a, a great book by um, uh, David Abrams called Spell of the Sensual. And it's basically a, philo a philosophical book. It's quite a slog, but it's worth reading. And it's pretty much about how written language naturally distances people from nature. Because from the time that writing begins, it's pictographic, you know, a, a, a drawing of a snake describes a snake. And then eventually symbols, uh, letters become more abstracted to the point where they're symbols, where they have no bearing on the thing that originally inspired them. And these app logos are a great example of that. They, they become so abstract and so stylized and so removed from the natural world. Um, and human brains only have so much space to store recognizable imagery and logotype. Um, and that's very much proven by a lot of scientific study. Um, so the same space that used to take up our heads with the plants and animals that will live around us are now taken up by brand names and logos, which is a really scary thought when you think about the state that the world is in. So all that was swirling around in my head in 2017 when I developed uh, uh, a really game-changing show at the Story of Fine Art in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, called A Different Animal. And funnily enough, this story actually relates very much to SKB. 
So up until this point, I was combining hyper, hyper realistically painted animals with very stylized and abstract backgrounds. And um, I, had, I was at an SKB workshop and, you know, being known as sort of, you know, the contemporary wildlife guy, I was asked by at least three people to review their work and tell me what did I think of their attempts to go in a more uh, uh, contemporary direction. And every single one of them I said, you're, you're, I like it, but you're too tentative. It's half-assed. You're, you're, you, you know, you, when you go a little bit contemporary, it's just, it's not far enough. So it looks like it's unfinished. It looks like you haven't decided what you're doing. If you're gonna do it, dive in with both feet. And it was the right advice to give. The funny thing was, is right after that um, SKB workshop, I went to Jackson Hole, where um, my gallery rep at Astoria, Greg Fulton, pulled me aside. I had just delivered a couple pieces they, one was a herd of elk and one was a herd of bison. And some of them were done in incredible detail. Some of them were in objective color and some of them were purple. And Greg said, you know, Andrew, I love your work and it's not like we're not selling it, but you could be doing better. I, we both know we could be doing better. And I think it's because you're not committing either way. Um, you know, the, the number of people who can appreciate the nuance of this combination of these two styles is it's not every collector. If you gave me a whole herd of purple bison, I'd sell it in a heartbeat to somebody with a white box contemporary home in Jackson Hole. If you gave me a whole herd of detailed uh, elk or bison, I'd sell that in a heartbeat to someone with a traditional, you know, log cabin home. But the, the in between, it's really, it's, it's a hard sell. Um, ask yourself, where your heart lies. Does it lie with doing the detail and things as they actually are, or does it lie in reinterpreting them in these fantastic ways? And I just thought, damn it, my own words coming back to bite me in the ass, which is really what it was. I was getting the same advice I had just given people at the SKB workshop. So uh, I knew I was going to have a show the following year, and I just said, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to not do nearly the detail I've been doing because frankly, I'm just getting tired of it. And it makes my hand hurt. Um, and I'm just going to go for it and I'm going to do the most unapologetic contemporary collection I've ever done. And that's what I did. So um, the, the concepts that I wanted to deal with, uh, going back to the sort of Andy Warhol soup cans, were mass production. So that pattern series that started with the modern camouflage series with the owls and the wallpaper became these patterned backgrounds that, you know, suggest the industry that surrounds, in this case, chickens. Um, ubiquity, so animal subjects that are so common, like the raven, that they just kind of become a part of the landscape and giving them their due, their showcase. Uh, reproductive capacity, uh, this one is called multiplication tables. Um, and it's no uh, accident that I've chosen to portray these rabbits in sort of Easter colors. Um, again, with my sort of conceptual side, um, I'm sort of very deliberately alluding to the Christian Easter and the pagan Yastre, um, suggesting the um, sort of sense of rebirth and renewal that we associate with Easter and with rabbits. Um, again, because of their reproductive capacity. Um, sort of becomes a bit tongue in cheek. Um, and then I started doing a, a similar series of pieces. Uh, this was for a show in England where I was uh, um, taking a look at um, specifically um, heritage livestock um, that's actually endangered um, at, or in danger of disappearing from the uh, uh, livestock gene pool. Um, this is one of those pieces uh, dealing with that uh, concept. Um, so uh, uh, the idea of less is more is really important to me. Um, this is a piece um, by Barnett Newman, 1952-51. Uh, this is one of his um, so-called zip paintings. Um, what's really interesting about these, especially when you see them in person, because most of them are quite large, is that they're completely flat areas of color, but the contrast in value and the placement of the stripes actually creates a sense of depth. It looks like this very faint stripe is falling back in space. It looks like this bright white stripe is coming forward. And in person, it creates a really interesting sort of oscillation. The painting kind of vibrates. Very much the way that if you sit and stare at a Rothko for long enough, it, a really good one can appear to start to move. Um, and this, of course, you may have already figured out, really relates back to that notion of is the canvas a flat surface to be decorated or is it a window into which we can enter? And this is a great example of a piece that all it is is flat color and yet it manages to achieve perceptible depth. 
um, which is fascinating to me. So I had the idea of what would happen if a bunch of birds flew into a Barnett Newman painting and perched on the stripes. Uh, and that led to the string theory series. Um, these are blue tits. This was uh, again for my show, my last show in England. Um, and what really fascinated me about this idea is that, you know, if you take those birds out of there, it's a color field painting and nothing more, but simply the juxtaposition of the birds sort of looking like they're clinging to these uh, stripes turns them into an actual environment, a non-objective environment, but an environment nonetheless. And again, this speaks back to that notion of, of uh, the adaptability of birds to a man-made um, landscape. Uh, this is a similar piece uh, with the Kingfisher. Um, although this one also starts to harken back, I think, to the modern camouflage series, just in terms of the fact that it starts to feel a bit like wallpaper, I hope in an interesting way. Um, so that string theory series has become a huge series. I'm actually on number, I've done 18 of them so far, which probably is one of my larger series I've ever done. Um, this piece is at Astoria Fine Art right now. It's one of my favorites. Um, this is another one with uh, Orioles. This one's quite big. I think it's uh, 24 by 30 or something like that. Um, and this piece I just hung at Sanders Gallery here in uh, Tucson. This, these are um, American crows. Um, but these pieces give me a really fun opportunity to deal with color fields, to deal with um, you know, really interesting palettes. Sometimes the palettes are directly related to the birds themselves. Sometimes the palettes are very fanciful or intended to create a certain mood. Um, but, uh, but always there's this sense of very flat shapes that within the context of the painting and particularly with the addition of the birds take on a sense of three-dimensional depth and a life of their own. Um, so I, I always like to talk a little bit about this painting. Um, this is a piece by William Strutt from 1896. Um, I have, I'm pretty sure, the original uh, late 1800s litho of this piece, the sepia piece. It's in a very old frame and it hung in my grandparents' house for many years. My um, grandparents on my dad's side had the most kid-unfriendly house on the planet. And when we would go over there, my sister and I would just be bored out of our skulls. It was that kind of house where you walked in and it was dark as hell, there were no toys to play with, and you'd hear this clock going you know, because there was no noise. And my brother and my grandfather would play cribbage while my sister and I like stared at a wall. And the only thing in the house that I liked was this painting. And I would just get kind of lost in, you know, the, the animals and the relationship. Uh, it's supposed to be a young Jesus. I've always thought it looked like a little girl, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I, just, I just was really in love with the, with the animals and with the narrative. Um, and uh, I didn't really think about it until years later, but this was probably the first experience I ever had with animals in art. Um, and uh, I will always wonder how formative that is. And to me, it's one of the great gifts of being an artist is that, you know, there are thousands of paintings that I've done that are hanging in hundreds of homes. And uh, I will never know whether or not some little kid is staring up at one of my paintings and that's his or her first experience with seeing animals in art. Um, it's a very special piece to me. Um, but the religious overtones should not be overlooked um, because one of the things that I think this influenced is a whole series of work, not so much a series, but a, a running theme through my work, which is sort of nature as church, animals as icons. Because there's a lot of suggestion that animals just aren't an important enough subject for art. And there are so many examples of animals in art, but not a lot of examples until the emergence of uh, 20th century wildlife art of animals being the primary subject, the focus. There are examples, but just not a lot. And why is that? You know, the very first examples of art that we have are cave paintings of, of, uh, of animals. You know, what, who, who decided that animals aren't an important subject? So um, painting animals, and uh, reflecting on uh, or referring to religious references is a way for me to imbue animal subjects with the importance and the um, uh, reverence that I believe they and nature in general deserve. Um, this is probably one of the most recognizable images in the history of wildlife art, a young hare by Albrecht Dürer from 1502. And of course he was primarily a religious illuminist painter but he took the time to do this very thoughtful study um, of a hare. 
Um, although everyone debates about the title because it's clearly not a young hair, it's a mature hair, but we'll give them a pass on that. Um, so this piece, um, talking about animal icons, this is uh, called Michelle's Magic Bunny, and it was from an experience with a friend of mine named Michelle where we were out hiking and came across this jackrabbit. And it became a piece that very much nods deliberately to Albert Durer's young hair, which you just saw. And um, I'm really pleased to say that this piece is part of the permanent collection of the National Museum of Wildlife Art in Jackson Hole. Uh, this is a piece called Horace that uh, this is a um, Nero pencil drawing with um, gold leaf and uh, you know this is very much um, and I think pretty obviously nodding to the iconographic significance of um, hawks and eagles in Egyptian art and iconography um, which is an area that really interests me. Um, this is a piece uh, which uh, has often referred to as my crucified bird painting, um, and uh, it's called Primary. Um, and I did this piece back in my Pacific Wildlife Gallery days. Um, a uh, red-breasted sapsucker had hit the window of the gallery. The gallery owner called me and I came and collected it. And um, I was able to pose it before it went into rigor. And I just thought it was such a beautiful thing. And I'd actually never seen a red-breasted sapsucker, or excuse me, is it red-breasted or red-headed? I think it's red-breasted. Anyway, I'd never actually seen one before, even though it's a bird native to the area that I grew up in. And I just thought it deserved the reverence of a, of a painting. I just thought it, it needed, uh, so I, I kind of looked at it as like an ode um, to the bird. Um, but it's definitely a piece that, that takes on an, an iconographic context um, and that, uh, you know, suggests the sort of sacrifice of nature, um, you know, bird flying into the glass and uh, certainly the outstretched wings are, are suggestive of uh, some various ob obvious uh, uh, nods to religious references. Um, and then there's this piece, which is probably one of my best examples of this um, uh, series. Um, this one is called uh, Icon. And I was in Kenya and observed this vervet monkey with her child. And it was just one of those incredibly intimate moments with nature that I will just never forget. And I was trying to think of a way to portray it with the sensitivity and reverence it deserves. And despite being, um, not having been raised religious, I've always loved that early Christian art um, the, where you know, the Madonna is always portrayed in a very severe way. She's like a lady you don't want to run into in a dark alley. And Christ usually looks like a 35 year old man. Um, but there is always that amazing gold leaf and there's the incredible colors. Um, and they're painted with such love and such deification. And um, I wanted to bring that same level of reverence to a humble animal subject. And I should point out at this point that these pieces are absolutely never meant to parody anybody's religious belief. It's, 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 it's the exact opposite of that. I want to take a shared iconographic language that has an incredible potency within um, our um, culture and our history and use it as a tool to communicate the love that I have for nature. And that's very much what, what these paintings are about. Um, and that brings us to totems. Uh, so some of you may be familiar with my totem series. This is me in front of a um, totem in uh, uh, Vancouver, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, I've always been fascinated with these totems and have thought for many years, like how do I interpret these in a painting? And I got an idea, this is, um, Stacked Frogs by my friend Tony Hochstetler. And uh, this is a piece by um, Peter Wojtuk. Um, and both of these artists in bronze have found very different ways of creating pieces that are not necessarily totems, but that are totemic. They're definitely the, the verticality and this notion of stacking and the balance issue are all very suggestive to me of this sort of root inspiration, the totem pole. So I thought to myself, well, these two sculptors that I really respect can do this. I can find a way to reinterpret the totem pole within the context of painting. And um, I never, um, I'm always very cautious about this because um, uh, the, the side of my family that claims to have Native American ancestry, there are like no records whatsoever. Um, you know, it's all very anecdotal, but um, you know, I grew up with the notion that um, my 
grandfather's mother was half Sioux Indian. And um, it's something I've never um, really explored the veracity of um, beyond, I think, I think there's one picture of her and she's wearing a nightgown and holding a pistol. It's a great picture. Um, and, uh, uh, but it's definitely something having grown up with that, that I've always had a great respect for Native American art, iconography, um, and uh, particularly the storytelling and the way that animals are um, imbued with so much um, uh, uh, thought and influence and symbolic importance. So I wanted to sort of bring that to my own um, series of paintings. Um, so this is an example of one of those. This is, um, these are all numbered. I think I'm on 12 or 13 totems at this point. Uh, this one is uh, stacked desert bighorns. And uh, this was, I think, the first one I did, which is stacked cardinals. Um, all these, by the way, are part of that A Story of Fine Art show where I really tried to break out of my own mold and do something different. This one is called Teton Totem, sort of all the big ungulates of uh, the Grand Tetons stacked together. Um, this one is uh, um, Scrub Jays. Uh, uh, that one's at a story right now. This one is um, Gamble's Quail, which uh, I've done since I moved to uh, Tucson because I see these birds every day. This is uh, Stacked Owls. This piece also has some gold leaf in it, which is kind of fun. And uh, the, the totem pieces sort of became further stylized into what I call my pinnacle series. I think I'm on four or five of these. They're all little tiny hummingbirds perched atop these kind of tall plinths. And again, it kind of gets back to that notion of an animal as an icon. You know, they're, um, all the plinths are um, either white gold, yellow gold, um, or, um, uh, red gold leaf, um, and they all sort of suggest putting wildlife on a pedestal, which is something I really tried to do in my work, you know, to, to take an intimate wildlife portrait and somehow um, make it bigger um, uh, or more uh, important um, to communicate the reverence I have for the subject. So um, one of the things that um, anybody who, and I don't know how many people watching, um, took my workshop when I was a featured instructor at SKB and really took people through my process with the building up of the acrylic paint and heavy layers, the sanding it down. Needless to say, my painting process has become extremely complicated, extremely multi-step intensive, um, and uh, I, I enjoy it, I love it. I'm still doing it for a whole host of reasons. But um, the, the bottom line is, is that it requires me to plan everything out really obsessively. Now that doesn't mean that happy accidents don't happen along the way, but it does mean that I have to have a very clear idea of where I'm going from the moment I start the piece. So when all this quarantine business started, um, you know, realistically, it hasn't changed my life that much because I was, I'm very fortunate. I know a lot of artists who had important shows canceled. I didn't have any major upcoming shows until this summer, and it looks like my Jackson Hole show will still happen. Um, although my show in England this fall may not happen, then we may postpone that to next year, um, but I can live with it. Um, but at any rate, um, you know, having been between shows at the time that the lockdown started, you know, I was doing what I'd be doing anyway, which is painting day in and day out and putting those pieces aside, not selling anything in hopes that I sell them a few months down the road, which is, you know, the way any professional artist lives for the most part. But psychologically, it was very different. I started thinking, oh God, what if I don't sell anything? And I had, of course, just delivered a big batch of new paintings to Sanders Gallery here in Tucson. And, you know, February, March, April is our best season because of the tourism when the weather is fabulous in, in Arizona. Um, and it was like the second those paintings got there, everything shut down. And I'm like, well, great, no one's seen them. So I really started to worry about money and sales. Um, anybody who knows me, it's nothing in comparison to what Pam and Lee are dealing with, but we've had a massive plumbing problem at this house since I moved in. We've had this massive termite problem. Every time I turn around, something's fallen off this house. We're just starting to emerge from it now, but I put tons of money into it. And it just put me in a state where we're fine, but it made me really nervous. And when all this stuff started happening, I thought, God, there's got to be some way for me to just, you know, make, you know, the little bit of money, a little bit of cash flow here and there to, you know, pay the bills, um, you know, while I'm waiting for things to recover. So one morning, I just very spontaneously sat down 
I did a mixed media watercolor and acrylic study of a vermilion flycatcher, which is one of our, my favorite local birds that we have here. I'm very fortunate to see them almost every day. They're just stunning. And I put it on Facebook with a little message about, you know, trying to brighten people's day during this difficult time and, you know, um, doing these quick little quarantine studies. I'm just trying this out, you know, who knows. Uh, 250 bucks postage paid to the first person to private message me on Facebook. Um, bear in mind, this is a, 10 inch by seven and a half inch piece and it took me you know maybe an hour and a half to do uh i sold it in six minutes and uh since then i have sold 20 of them from the first of april up until just a few days ago so it's really just taken on a completely different life of its own um and i'm super super grateful for it um and for me it's been so much fun to sit down and do something because my usual work is so thought intensive and so conceptual and I'm coming up with these ideas and I'm hashing out how I want the paintings to look and I'm doing pre-studies, just to sit down and paint is just an immense relief. Um, and uh, that's why for the rest of our time today, what I'm gonna do is demo um, one of these little quick studies um, so you get an idea of uh, how that works. So that is the end of the presentation. I'm gonna switch back to my iPad here and um, get started. Is it limited to an hour, two hours? Oh, we have it scheduled for an hour and a half. Okay. We can go so uh, Anthony, how do I click out of this back to my iPad? Ah, great, thank you. Okay, so um, I'll just show you real quick, these are, these are some of my little quarantine studies. I, I tend to do them in batches. Um, so this, these are a couple of the ones that I've uh, finished but haven't posted yet. And uh, what I'm gonna do is uh, set my iPad up here, looking down on the one I'm working on now. Uh, I just thought it would be fun because I'm, I'm such a bird guy and I thought, yeah, I just I need to do something other than a bird. So this is gonna be a little bunny study that I'm gonna do here. Um, by the way, along the way, um, I'm really happy to answer questions. Um, there you are. Is Deanna going in and out? <laughs> I don't like the background. So, this so everybody's unmuted. So if you want to ask Andrew any questions, you can talk to him now. Andrew. I wonder if Andrew is posting those on Facebook. I've been posting them on my personal Facebook feed um, about once a week. Um, and then in addition to that, um, I've gotten a lot of people sending me requests, and then I do that privately. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm just mixing up um, some watercolor here. It's, it's funny, I feel a bit self-conscious because I've you know, got David Rankin watching and Mort Silver watching, and I'm, I, I haven't, uh, these little quarantine studies are probably the first time I've really used watercolor uh, in about 10 or 15 years. Um, but I used to do a lot of watercolor. It's just uh, really fun to get back into that a bit. So I'm using a combination of things. I've got some uh, Winsor Newton watercolors here and I've got some uh, Dale Aroni um, watercolor inks. Um, I really like the um, liquid uh, watercolor inks. They're, they're a little bit different than traditional watercolor. Um, there are a lot of different brands on the market. The reason I went with the Dale Aronis is because they're the far and away the most light fast. Um, a lot of the um, watercolor inks are really, um, are not light fast. Um, but I'm doing a um, UV sealant on all of these pieces when they're finished anyway. So that does uh, help to some extent. And you're doing these on paper? Oh yeah, thank you, that's a good question. So this is a watercolor board. So this is um, 
Uh, it's a, a specifically um, Crescent premium watercolor board. It's very heavy. Yes. Yes. Um, hey, Andrew, I have a question. Yeah. Um, and that was a fantastic presentation. I oh, learned a lot, actually. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah, thank you for, yeah. Um, my question is, so I, I know you're still fascinated with the totems and the string theory. Yeah. Is there another thread that's been kicking around in your head that you haven't had a chance to prototype yet, but you're stewing on that? Mm. That's a good question. Um, not not anything um, game changing at the moment. I, I do think um, you know it's one of the things that I really try to do um, is, uh, and it's it's probably the best advice I can give to any artist is that to never edit yourself. That the way that you grow and change an artist is. If something pops into your head that you think might be a good idea, you just need to do it. Um, and uh, that means, you know, just being very open to um, your inspiration. So when an idea comes, I will definitely pursue it. Um, but um, usually these ideas, like the ones that like come into your head, like the modern camouflage series, where it just pops into my brain as like a finished idea, and then I have to think about it for a couple of years before I do it, that's very unusual. Usually it's more like I do this painting and I've d I do something I've done before, but I take it just a little bit further. And then I take it just a little bit further beyond that and then it becomes something else. That's usually more like how it actually happens. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm very open to uh, kind of the next thing to come along, but I don't uh, actually know what that will be yet. Cool. Well, thank you. That, that that is a useful, interesting, <laughs> helpful answer too. Yeah. Okay, so I've got some of my little colors mixed up here. And uh, what I'm gonna do, pardon me. So I'm gonna start by just wetting the whole thing. What is your primary, what is your primary paint? Oops. Can you hear me, Andrew? Uh, no, not in and out. Sorry, um, my, what is my primary what? What is your primary drawing job? Oh, it's just graphite. It is just graphite. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Let's see, I'm gonna, I put the water down, but I'm gonna kind of brush out a little bit where some of the strongest whites are. Uh, okay. And I'm gonna let the water kind of drip down here. This is the part that I really enjoy. It's just really fun and I, I don't know what it's gonna look like, but I have to be open to it. This is where I'm channeling my inner Mort Solberg. <laughs> So, there's no gum in And one of the things that makes these so fun for me is that unlike 90% of my work, they're really not calculated at all. Um, and that's very deliberate. So um, if it looks messy uh, and uh, like I don't know what I'm doing, it's because I don't. I'm really just kind of trying to let the paint do its thing and see where it leads me. I don't like that red, I don't think. There we go. Let's see, I'm going to brush out a little bit where that tail is. There we go. Do you find the watercolor inks to be even more transparent than the normal pigments? 
Um, you know, I don't even know. Uh, I, I think the main reason that I favor the, the liquid ones is that when I first started with watercolor, that's what I, that was sort of what I first fell in love with were the liquid ones. Um, so I'm just sort of kind of going back to them, I suppose, more by force of habit than anything else. And again, you have to understand that like, I was a little bit resident about demoing this today because all of this is like super new for me. Um, you know, these are just, these are pieces that I'm playing with. Um, but I kind of thought too, you know, it's, uh, it's important for people to know that, you know, just because you have a signature style, just because you have work in museums, doesn't mean you can't still just bring, break out your paints and just play. Um, and that's really more than anything what, uh, what these pieces represent for me is uh, just me, me having an opportunity to play a little bit. So along the way, um, that's a roundabout way of me saying, along the way, I will undoubtedly find better and more appropriate ways to sort of refine this. Um, but, um, you know, this is sort of the way I'm, I'm starting off now. So, um, so at that point, I mean, that's pretty much it. I'm going to set that aside and I'm going to grab this guy, which is one that I prepared in advance. So pretty much the exact same approach. I just, uh, did this uh, quick little study. There's my little photo reference there. So, um, going to put the watercolor palette. And uh, dive back into my old standbys, which are acrylics. Pardon me one sec, just need some clean water. Ah. So, um, what I'm going to mix up here is um, my sort of stock and trade standard palette. Um, so I'm a big believer in a limited palette. Um, I used to have much more, many more colors in my palette. I still adjust by the painting because I'm a, I really believe every painting is a unique set of problems to be solved. So you never want to get into a place where it's like, I never want to hear anybody say, oh, I, I use these colors because that's the way I paint. No, you use them because you experiment with a lot of things over time. You've winded it down to the bare essentials, just what you need. But, you know, if I'm painting something like an Indian blue peafowl, where I actually genuinely need thalocyanine green and manganese blue, then I'm going to add to this palette. But what I'm showing you is my sort of core base palette, which is really very flexible and which is um, sort of the base palette of every painting that I've done over the last 10 or 15 years. So my first step is I'm mixing, um, I don't like using pigmentary black, I'm mixing my black substitute from Hooker Green Deep Hue Permanent and Naphthol Crimson. Um, these are uh, Liquitex paints, by the way. Um, I do use some other brands, but most of my palette is Liquitex. And uh, so I've got that Naphthol Crimson on there. I've got a Burnt Sienna. Um, where is my, there we go. Uh, I've got a uh, bronzed yellow, which is a great, really versatile kind of muddy color that I love. Those who are not fans call it baby poop brown, but I love it. I think it's a great color. Um, Cad Yellow Deep. And titanium white. And then on the other side of the black, I'm going to give my some dioxazine purple and some cobalt blue. All right, so recenter on this guy here. So hopefully everybody can see that all right. Um, also, I've got on my palette, um, I like to have a very small quantity of water where I can get to it really easily. And I know it sounds silly, but um, having had some pretty serious health problems from overwork, 
most of which was nerve damage and had to do with an ergonomically poorly designed workspace. The difference between going like this back and forth to your water off to a side 2,000 times a day and having your water here in your palate and doing this is the difference between micro and macro movement. And uh, it does actually make a difference to one's stamina um, at the easel or drafting table as I'm at now. Um, and these little, these little containers I have taped to my palate, uh, they're the same ones that like when you're out on the road and you go to a cafe in the middle of nowhere along I-5 or whatever, um, you know, they have those horrible jellies that are basically like colored sugar. That's these containers. So I just save those. Okay. So let's see, I think I'm gonna put my palette on this side and my painting on this side. And the study reference over there. Okay, so I've got um, my brushes laid out. Um, I, I do have a larger brush I'm gonna use, but I'm also gonna be using this liner brush a lot. Um, I do a lot of work with liner brushes. They're great for fine detail, but um, also just really good for con having control over what you're doing. Um, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of liners. Um, I'm gonna start though by, um, I wanna put emphasis on the head of the rabbit. And the way I'm gonna um, achieve that is first by coming in and uh, putting in sort of a backing value to help make the head stand out. And I'm gonna use kind of a gray blue color, I think. There we go, that'll work. And feel free to shout out any questions you might have as I go along, either about what I'm doing or anything that you feel like asking me. I don't have a problem working and talking at the same time. You may have been muted by me because of some background noise. So if you're trying to talk and you can't, he doesn't hear you, it's because of me. Just check to see if you've been unmuted or muted. Thank you, Anthony. Yep. I'm trusting you to mute anybody who's like really annoying. I can do that. <laughs> no, there's no one annoying in SKB. Besides me. Yeah, but that's why we love you. Oh, thank you. Could you tell us at some point what um, archival spray you use when you're done and how many coats, for example? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, it is um, the same product that John Siri Lester recommended to me about 25 years ago. Um, and it is uh, Krylon, uh, they used to call it Krylon Crystal Clear. And then for some reason they came out with a like cheap student grade version. So they changed the original Crystal Clear to Krylon UV resistant clear. Um, so yeah, it's, it's Krylon UV resistant clear um, it's a spray-on varnish. Um, on these little studies, I do four coats. Um, and uh, on my uh, acrylic paintings on board, I usually actually do eight. Um, and the one that I use is a matte finish. Um, mm. I um, personally, and again, everybody's different. It's not to criticize anybody else, but um, I really don't like varnishes that change the look of the work. Um, and what I like about the Krylon UV resistant clear in matte is that the finish that it gives to the work, it definitely evens the sheen because there's always parts of your painting that have more built up paint or less built up paint or glazing versus um, more opaque treatments where there's going to be a difference in sheen. Um, and what's nice about the UV resistant clear is that it evens the sheen out but the overall finish is very similar to how acrylic looks when you've done nothing to it at all. And I really like that about it. I like, I like that it doesn't, 
you know, I, I don't like those varnishes that, you know, give your painting like a wet look. Um, also because, you know, I, I, it makes it, um, you know, that sort of wet look makes it much harder to hang the piece because then you've got to worry about reflection and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and that's less of a concern here because of course these pieces will be under glass, but um, yeah. Cool, so I've got a little bit of uh, sort of background blocking in around the rabbit. Let me do a little bit more of that. Um, and this really is this, um, uh, this uh, Crescent Premium Watercolor Board. It is a great surface. Funnily enough, I actually for about 10 years, I used it exclusively for um, very finished drawings. And part of it is just that like, as someone who paints on board, I'm just like really paranoid about, I, like one of the things I don't, like I've, I've, I've had a canvas stabbed, you know, and, uh, or torn. And I really, if I'm doing something that I'm really putting a lot of time and energy into, I wanna make sure that the board, that the, the product that I'm working on is just very stable um, and not easily damaged. So with that in mind, I really like working on um, painting on board and, uh, um, you know, using, um, uh, doing something like a drawing, I thought, well, God, I want to do a drawing and then like accidentally crinkle it and ruin it. Um, so I started doing um, drawings, uh, really fine finished drawings, you know, for gallery shows on um, the Crescent watercolor board. And um, when I started, you know, doing these little studies, it's just, it's honestly, it's just what I had around and I thought, well, it's intended to be a multimedia board. I've just never used it for that. It's time to give it a shot and see if it works. And uh, I'm pleased to say that it is in fact a brilliant surface for doing um, mixed media. Just holds up very, very well. So I'm using my drawing here as a base and I'm just gonna kind of start building up some color and value, bringing this little guy to life. And what's nice about doing these again is that I, I really, I'm not starting this process with a huge preconception about what I want it to look like. I'm just sort of letting it happen, which, um, and I mean, I'm making conscious decisions, but I'm making them very quickly on the fly. Um, and that's just not typically the way that I work. So like I said, the, uh, the sort of fun and enjoyment and relief factor of doing this kind of work um, is really, really, um, significant for me because it just, it allows me to loosen up in a way that I don't usually let myself. Because always at the back of my mind is if I screw one of these up, eh, no big deal. Mm -hmm. Hey Andrew, it's Michelle. So hi from California. Hey. Hi uh, Michelle. How are you guys doing? We're doing good, thanks. You guys too hot there or is it not so bad? You know, it is, we're still in that kind of, it's perfect and beautiful type temperature right now. Um, actually today is, we're in a bit of a cool spell. It's probably, we still got the doors and windows open. It's about, uh, oh, I don't know, 75 degrees. So yeah, we're, we're lucking out right now. We've, we've definitely, we've had our first several days of, uh, you know, 100 plus degree temperatures, but, um, it's, uh, it's really still quite, quite lovely. How about you? How are you guys doing in uh, Los Gatos? Oh, yeah, we're uh, finally getting some rain, which we actually need before we go into the, you know, brutal dry season. But yeah, everything's yeah. good here. Yeah. I had a quick question of what, what you're doing with these little demos. So the watercolor wash that you did, did you spray anything on your graphite drawing first? Or did you? I did not. Okay, no. and then yeah. that was completely dry before you started in with the acrylic. So right now what you're working on is a dry surface? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Okay, yeah. And I just did that because I, I wanted to be able to demo this, and so I did two different variations of the bunny because I knew I you know, wouldn't have time in this context to let the uh, watercolor dry. 
For, fortunately, here in Arizona, everything dries incredibly quickly. So I can, I can probably work on it uh, in just a couple of hours. All right. But well, yeah. This, the, is, this is fun to watch. Hug, hug the puppies for me. I will. Thank you. And same for yours. But yeah, so these, these have been really fun. And uh, like I said, with the, um, the notion of, uh, of doing these on Facebook, um, you know, it was, it was really kind of a shot in the dark. I, I didn't know how people would react to it. And I was a little bit nervous to tell you the truth at first because, you know, I've gotten to a point where, you know, a small work for me, um, I mean, I sold, you know, some six by six pieces last year uh, for just under $1,000 each. Um, and, you know, I'm starting to sell some, you know, very large works for, you know, pr pretty good money. And I thought, well, if I do, you know, little things and sell them for $250, is that going to, is that going to devalue my work? And it would, if I was selling pieces that took me, you know, 30 hours in the studio to do, but I thought, well, you know, these don't look anything like the rest of my work. I mean, they do share in common a sort of melding of abstraction in just sort of the loose watercolor work with um, wildlife in, in a more um, representationally realistic context. Um, but other than that, you know, they're, they're approaching it in a very, very different way. So I thought, you know, just consider these to be a completely separate thing. Time yourself. Don't let yourself spend more than a couple of hours on each one and uh, offer them at a low price point. And, uh, you know, some of them, I and mean, I'm calling them studies, um, you know, some of them, uh, you know, are good enough ideas that they will eventually influence um, larger pieces. In fact, the um, Raven that's in progress for Western Visions um, started as one of these studies. Um, so, uh, so there's definitely, um, and what I found that's, that fascinates me is that it's not, you know, I haven't had anybody who's bought a $10,000 painting from me buy one of these. It's not bleeding into my other market. What it's done is opened up a whole different market. Because um, most of the people who have bought these are, are people who, you know, like me, they're other artists. Um, I buy work from other artists, but, you know, right now with what's happening with the economy and everything, it's really, you know, it, it doesn't feel like a comfortable time to splurge on anything. Um, but a few hundred bucks here and there, you know, pretty much everybody can do. And if it brightens their day and brings some uh, joy into their life that, you know, is in point of fact, what, you know, big part of the purpose of art is to express your, your joy at living, um, then I think that's a really great thing. Um, and it's been really fun for me because it's, um, it's actually also been a way to communicate with people during this time. I mean, I've heard from people, actually, I just sold a piece the other day, one of these studies to an old friend of mine from high school that I literally haven't seen or talked to in 20 years. Um, and I, I've vaguely interacted with her on Facebook enough that I, you know, know that she's alive and she knows that I'm alive, but you know, we haven't talked. And all of a sudden here's this person saying, Oh, I've been following your work and it's been so wonderful to see you evolve. And we always, you know, loved how, what you were doing in high school and you've made a life out of it. And we're so happy for you and blah, 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 blah. And it just, it just made me feel really good to, um, you know, have, uh, have that interaction. Um, and, uh, and to know that what I was doing was allowing people who wouldn't ordinarily be able to collect my work um, to, to have a little piece of me. Because um, that's the thing that, you know, you start to understand as a working artist is that, you know, when you sell your work, you really are selling yourself. You're selling a little piece of yourself. And uh, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of an amazing thing that, you know, when you, when you part ways with the painting, um, what you're really doing is becoming a part of someone else's daily life. Um, you know, and I mean, it's certainly true for me, the, the paintings that hang on my wall are um, almost exclusively by artists that I know. Um, and funnily enough, some of them that I bought from artists I didn't know, I now do know them. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when I see and look at and enjoy those pieces, um, it reminds me of them. Um, and that's very powerful. So if by doing these little studies, I can broaden the number of people that I can reach with my work, then um, I'm really grateful for that. Um, in addition to the fact that, you know, with all of the hardships that Guy and I have had lately, um, some of you know Guy's health has been really poor. Um, he's getting better, but it, that's been a struggle. And, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's been a challenging time for us um, with this move. And, uh, 
you know, if we can uh, help make ends meet with uh, selling some of these little studies and I can enjoy myself while I'm doing it, then uh, kind of awesome. When you sell these, I'm assuming you don't put, you don't frame them. Uh, no, uh, there have been a couple that I have framed for, um, uh, like I've sold one to a neighbor of mine and one to a friend on the other side of Tucson and, you know, cause I was going to hand deliver them anyway. Um, we did like, you know, safe distancing, drop by the doorstep on deliveries. Um, they had asked me if I would frame it and I went ahead and used my framer and I just, I, I got reimbursed for the framing. But yeah, at that price point, that's just for the piece itself. And actually one of the things that's made this so practical is that when I, after I sold the first one, just the, how quickly it sold, I really felt like I had tapped into something. And when I went to ship it at the post office, I picked up about 40 priority mail envelopes and um, I cut a whole ton of masonite down to an appropriate size. So now when I sell one of these, I've got this big stack of nine by 12 masonite or eight by 10 masonite boards. I sandwich the piece between two boards. I slide it into an envelope, um, put that into the priority mail envelope, um, uh, pay for the postage online, leave it by the doorstep, it gets picked up and out it goes. And it costs about $12 to ship each one. Um, and I include that in the cost of the, of the piece. Um, so it really, um, uh, ship, shipping them out unframed in that very easy format is, uh, is, is, a, is a big part of what's made it practical for me to keep doing this. So when is the bidding open on this thing now that we are watching you paint it? Oh, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Well, anybody who's really interested in something, just shoot me a private message. As uh, that's pretty much what I've been, what I've been doing uh, throughout this uh, process. So, when you do ship them, do you do you just let your um, purchaser decide how they want to frame it, or do you have recommendations? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, obviously anybody's welcome to frame anything however they want, but um, I do have a framer. In fact, that's a tidbit I would love to throw out there. Um, there is an online on-demand framer called Frame Destination. They are out of Texas. I love them. They are um, extremely good value for the money. They're very quick. Um, they have just reopened uh, their factory. Um, they've got a bit of a backlog because they were closed for about two months. Um, but framedestination.com, I highly recommend. Um, in particular, um, those of you who know my acrylic paintings know that I, uh, for the, about the past uh, five or six years, I frame everything in these very simple um, float frames um, that are designed to hold um, one of the very thick two inch deep cradled panels that I use, that I paint on. Um, and uh, uh, so I have my sort of stock molding that I use for every piece that you know comes in a variety of colors. And it's just hugely simplified my framing life. I don't agonize anymore about how I'm gonna frame stuff. I just, you know, it's like, oh, that's my molding, black, silver, or gold. Um, and, uh, but then they do also have a number of other frames and uh, they have a really nice simple um, black frame and they um, sell these lovely um, extra thick eight ply alpha rag mats, which is when I do flat work that needs to be behind glass. That's my sort of stock product to use is these wonderful extra thick mats because they just, they give the work a lot more presence. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Frame Destination is great and uh, I highly recommend them. And if, if people, if, if, if somebody tells me that they want a framing recommendation, and I'm not in a position where I can do it for them, um, what I can do is go online. There's a thing where you can upload a picture of the piece you're framing. I can upload that, I can mock out the framing, I can email that link to them, and if they like it, they can just click and order the frame. So you don't send the artwork to them, they send the frame to you. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, so there, there was a time, um, Claudia, when I used to um, build my own frames and I stopped doing that because I started feeling less like an artist and more like a carpenter. Um, and also too, like, you know, you, you, you realize, uh, oh, what just happened? Are we back? Okay, yeah. good. Sorry about that. Um, for some reason, it came up with a low battery warning, but I just plugged it in. Um, anyway, um, 
but yeah, I just got to a point where I, I started feeling like, um, you know, I was, I was spending all this time building frames rather than painting. And they were good, but they weren't professional quality frames. Um, and it's really important to be self-critical as an artist and to realize that you, know, you can't be a genius at everything. I do know artists who build their own frames and do beautiful paintings and make amazing frames and good for them, but it just, it's not me. Um, I, I never want to be one of those Dunning-Kruger types who's uh, actually fairly marginal at something, but thinks that they're a genius. Um, it's really important to be able to take a, a long and critical look at yourself and go, okay, how good am I at this really? And maybe a better use of my time and energy would be to paint and leave the framing to somebody who really knows their framing. Yeah. So uh, that's what I started doing. I think 2000. 10 or 11 was the last year that I built my own frames. So somewhere out there floating around are a few hand-built, hand-finished, hand-painted Andrew Denman frames that uh, a few either lucky or unlucky collectors have. <laughs> but there's not a, it's not a lot of them. I always think it's interesting, Andrew, when you go to the movie, after the movie's over, it runs for five minutes and everybody who's helped put that movie art together. And then we have our art and it says uh, painted by us, marketed by us, framed by us, right. <laughs> flipped by us. That's, well, that's a very good point. In fact, funnily enough, I just had a conversation like this the other day. Um, I'm uh, collaborating with a friend on some uh, music. I, I write a lot of poetry and lyrics, and one of my neighbors has a band. Um, they're really awesome. They have this whole soundproof studio so they can practice into the wee hours and it doesn't disturb their neighbors, which let me tell you, coming from a neighborhood in California with three garage bands, none of whom gave a fig if they kept you up all night, is kind of awesome. Um, but uh, he was lamenting about not being able to finish a song. And I said, well, you know, I write lyrics. I'd be, I'd really love to help you with that. And so we, we started this collaboration, which is really fun. And uh, just the other day we were having this discussion and I said, you know, as a, as a, I love doing this kind of collaborative work. Cause you know, as a visual artist, you know, you never say like, Hey, you know, come on over and, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's join forces to, you know, the two of us together, we'll be able to produce a more awesome painting than either of us by ourselves. I mean, that just doesn't really happen. Um, so it's really, it's really cool to um, uh, be able to, you know, collaborate with somebody on, on something because music is, you know, just, there's no way around it. It's super collaborative. Um, but art really isn't. Um, and it, particularly when you're self-employed and you're pinching pennies and you're trying to make ends meet and everything, it's really easy to get into this headspace where you're like, I have to do it all myself, I have to do it all myself. And of course, I've given lectures at the SKB workshop about self-marketing. And I'm very proud of the work that I've done marketing myself, you know, really taking control over my brand. But it's really important to remember that it is okay to outsource when you need to. There are going to be things that you will, you will try and you will find that you suck at um, or that you're fine at, but is fine good enough? You know, yeah. once you get to the point where you're, you're selling work for five or $10,000, shouldn't your frame be perfect, not just okay? You know, so, um, so that's kind of the point that I got to, you know, with the framing where I was like, yeah, these are okay, but you know, it's not, um, it's not really representative of how I want to present myself. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I can't be 100% great at everything. Um, so, you know, you start farming out the things you can. I actually have to mention here, I have to give a nod to my dear friend, Christine White, who, um, when I was struggling having, uh, so we, we moved into this house last year and um, amidst all sorts of different problems and everything took longer than I thought it would. And, you know, we had to get the studio set up right away because I had signed on for a sh summer show at Astoria and I hadn't done a single painting for it yet. Um, because, which is very unlike me. I mean, I'm the guy that gets things done six months in advance, always. Um, and I had all these paintings ideas. And I was like, I just don't know if I can physically accomplish this. And uh, Christine was in the process of uh, leaving her job and starting work as a full-time artist herself and offered to help. And so she came out here to Tucson and became my studio assistant for about a week and a half, um, which was really an awesome experience. And, uh, you know, there's a long history of artists 
working with assistants um, and uh, there's nothing wrong with it ethically. Um, but um, let me tell you something, the act of letting go enough to accept that help and let that happen was extraordinarily difficult. And I think the only reason I was able to do it is because Christine is such an awesome person and made it so easy to, um, to, to surrender that control and to collaborate. Um, but, um, you know, it's a great example for me and something I'll never forget. Um, and something that I might employ again, if I need to, of, uh, you know, how um, it is okay, even in the context of a solitary profession, to acknowledge that um, you can't always do it all on your own. That was like one of the best weeks of my life too. Oh. <laughs> like seriously, I didn't, it was the first time I've ever gone. I'm a kind of a homebody. It's the first time I've ever gone somewhere uh, for a week and not wanted to leave at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. No, I took, we, I, we didn't want you to leave either. I was just like, just move in, just stay. I, know. I was like, yeah, yeah, so. I know you've got a husband, but he'll adjust, just stay here. <laughs> he'll be fine. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, and I learned a ton. So uh, if Andrew ever asks you to be, he probably won't ask you. If you ever offer and he needs it and he says yes, it was really cool. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. No, that was a, that was a great experience, it really was. And yeah, I don't think that I could have uh, prepared that inventory in that amount of time. What's that, Anthony? That wasn't me. I don't know who that was. Oh, I thought that was you. Nope, my mic was muted. If someone was asking me a question, I missed it. Sorry. A little bit of background noise. Okay. So I'm just kind of picking away here on this texture. Anybody else have any more questions? So I do when I'm when I'm doing these pieces. Um, after this stage, I'll come back in, and I may also do some pencil work. Um, I've got a little bit more paint I want to apply to this, but um, I've got one more piece that's in progress that I'll show you some of my sort of pencil stage. So I could obviously do a lot more detail on this fur, but I'm going to kind of let it sit because I feel like when I come in, that's more well suited to coming in with um, uh, the pencil and, and doing that um, a bit later. So um, I'm just going to mix up. Now I said earlier that I'm an implied rather than an applied texturalist which is a fancy way of saying that I like my paintings to be smooth. Um, but again, probably because these pieces feel experimental to me and I'm not really attached to them. And if I don't like one, I can throw it in the trash. Um, it, it really, um, and it's advice I give to a lot of artists is that, you know, you don't be precious about your work. Once you get too precious about your work, you stop, being open to experimentation. And the minute you stop being open to experimentation, you stop growing because you're just, you're inhibiting yourself um, because you're afraid you're gonna mess it up. Um, whereas if you just acknowledge the fact that it's a process, then the notion of messing it up doesn't enter into it. It's I'm gonna try this and let's see how it works. <laughs> and uh, with that in mind, I, um, I started saying to myself, well, you know, I'd, I'd really like to play around with some more texture. So, um, one of the things I've been doing is um, adding some extra elements to this work. Somebody's unmiked. Uh, yeah, thanks. So I definitely uh, enjoy getting in with a little bit of applied texture on some of these. And playing around with some other elements. I don't like that little bit of white there. I never want to paint over too much of the watercolor base because I really like what's going on there, but I also don't want to be precious about that either. And I've got this fun little tool, where did it go? There it is. Use this a little bit to sort of carve into the paint, which I enjoy doing. And I do that a lot in my impasto treatment. It's just that uh, it then gets covered over with gesso and you see the marks, but you don't see the texture in the finished piece. So 
So I'm kind of using this thicker paint to sort of give him a sense of grounding. I've never seen so many people intensely stare at the screen before in my entire life. <laughs> I'm so glad. I think that's quite a compliment. But yeah, what you're really seeing me do here, honestly, more than anything, is play. Um, and I don't, I, I oftentimes feel like I don't play enough in my work. Um, which is funny, because like, I, I actually am a very experimental painter. I'm always trying new things, um, but um, you know these these quick studies. I mean, I've always done studies, but but the but they're always studies that I do. Like I'm working through how I want a finished piece to look, whereas these are just like I am doing this now. I am in this space that is about nothing but how to resolve how this looks in front of me right now. And if it becomes something else, great, but it doesn't have to be anything. Um, and that, um, for those of you who know me well, know um, is, a, um, is a hard headspace for me to get into because I take my work very seriously and just being purely playful with it. Um, really requires me to let go a lot. And uh, I'm not all that good at that. But hopefully these, uh, these quarantine studies, I mean, it's a great example of, uh, you know, how the crappiest circumstances can uh, lead to some really cool stuff as an artist, because uh, I don't think any of this I would be doing yeah. if it weren't for what's happening right now. So almost ready to surrender this one and just say it is what it is and I'm moving on. Just gonna get a little bit more darkness in there. You're out of focus, Andrew. Mm. Everything, so, everything got blurry. So how do, uh, let's see. Yeah, Anthony, how, how, what do I do to make it more focused? Cause I'm not really sure. I can see what Michelle's talking about, but it's- Yeah, it, it was a second ago, it just went. Yeah, the is icon it, being fussy. Is it okay now? No. Not, uh, there it is. No, it's okay. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. It's focusing on your arm every once in a while. Okay, yeah. I gotcha. So that brings up a question. Mm -hmm. um, how are you uh, filming this? With, with what? Machine. Oh, so I've got, um, I've got my, um, we're straddling two devices here. I did my presentation on my laptop, but I've got my iPad on a tripod with the long arm that's hanging over the drafting table right now. So you can see this. And I see that you have like a shelf. Um, I'm not going to call it paper that Oh, the shelf liner. Yeah. Shelf liner? Yeah. So um, the, uh, the, the angled surface is a um, necessity because of my tortured and constantly screwed up back um, that if I'm working at an angle, um, it's much more comfortable for me ergonomically. Um, but then everything wants to slide off the drafting table. Um, and the shelf liner is a great solution to that. It just, just holds everything in place really nicely. It's a super simple, um, like $2 solution right. to a uh, real hair pulling problem. So if you don't mind my asking what angle, um, this is Elizabeth LaRoe, by the way. Hi, Elizabeth. What, hi. What angle are you on with your um, board, your drafting table? Um, it's, uh, that's probably about a 30 degree slant. Mm -hmm. Just guesstimating. Okay, I think I'm gonna leave that there. I'm kind of at that point where I feel like 
if I start doing more to it, it's going to take away from rather than add to. Just going to leave that, leave him there. Um, and I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, and bring in. Uh, so actually, before I do that, um, put these two side by side. So again, you know, they're both bunnies. They're similar palettes, but uh, you know, I'm just sort of developing them in these these various stages. Um, the next one I'm going to bring in is. Um, to show you some of the pencil work that I've been doing. So this one is an in progress. It's, it's, you know, it's almost finished. I've done all of the acrylic work. Um, this is a cardinal. Um, this is actually a gift for a, a really dear friend of mine here in Tucson, uh, has just uh, gotten out of the hospital, having had a um, stage three or four glioma removed from her brain. Um, and uh, I called her husband and said, tell me what your wife's favorite bird is because I'm going to do it and send it to her. So <laughs> this is my, uh, my, my quarantine get well present for my friend. And uh, I'm going to show you kind of my little finishing touches here. Uh, let me grab these pencils. Um, This again is acrylic, is that correct? Uh, say that again? Watercolor and acrylic? Yes, yeah, so all the uh, sort of background bleeds and stuff that you see, that's all watercolor and watercolor ink. And then the bird itself, which started off just like you saw me do with the rabbit where it was a pencil drawing, um, I sort of worked um, first watercolor and then acrylic over it to refine it. Um, and now I'm gonna come in and just do a little bit of pencil work to, to finish the piece off. And this is going to be pretty delicate. I mean, I don't really need to do a lot to this. Um, I did, by the way, my, my um, interest in art, probably one of the first um, mediums that I really fell in love with was colored pencil. Um, and it was really at the urging of um, my first gallery representative that I, I had already worked in acrylic, but I had never, I had not done like serious acrylic work. And he really sort of pounded into me that, um, you know, serious artists don't use colored pencils, serious artists paint, which um, is, I'm glad to say that there's much more acceptance of, of, uh, of, of colored pencil as a fine art medium today than there was then. But, you know, from a commercial standpoint, he gave me the right advice. Um, but, uh, but it did, um, it definitely led to a great love affair with, um, uh, acrylic paints for me. Um, I don't regret that, but, um, you know, I haven't, I still have my several giant bags of colored pencils from uh, when I was super hyper excited about colored pencils. And every so often it's really nice to pull them out again. So what I try to do mostly with these uh, pencils is um, I may do a little bit of shading in places and it's a, it's a nice way to just sort of partially go over the watercolor and acrylic but and not change it too much but just introduce a little bit of texture and a little bit of uh shift in color and value i'm sort of layering in this pale peach over some of these grays and pinks and also again you know these are these are very admittedly mixed media studies and uh, i just kind of like the idea of you know really being open to the notion of, you know, of using different media and just playing with it until it feels right to me. Let's see. What kind of pencils are you using? Uh, these are Prismacolor, thank you. So I've got, I've got a couple different things in front of me. I've got, I've got Prismacolor colored pencils. Um, I've also got um, graphite. And I've also got um, Nero pencils, which um, are a favorite uh, 
sort of recent find of mine. I was uh, actually one of my students recommended Nero pencils to me a few years ago, and they just create these wonderful velvety blacks. They are um, basically a, an oil-based charcoal pencil. So I'm combining Prismacolors, Nero's, and um, just plain old graphite. And I'm really just using this um, stage. I mean, the changes are pretty subtle to just refine. And it also creates some really interesting things because in, in this case, I did some of that thicker acrylic on this and trying to draw over thicker acrylic um, brings out really interesting textures. So I'm also using um, the application of a dry media over the thicker wet media as a way to um, explore some of those interesting textures. And definitely I, I like being really gestural with this approach. So I'm just kind of having fun with it. Um, years and years ago, I remember attending a lecture given by an abstract painter. And one of the things that she said really stuck with me, which is that one of the hardest things to do in art is to make something look like it just happened. And I really believe that that's true. Um, the best of, of abstract work and the best of stylistic or just loose work um, all has that same quality. Um, certainly you see it, you know, it's relevant to mention to those of you who are interested in plain air, um, you know, that, that to me is the mark of a, of a really good plain air painting. And it's why, you know, serious plain air artists don't display every painting that they do because sometimes just that, that magic of out in the field, it all falls into place, doesn't happen. Now, just because the painting only took you a couple of hours doesn't mean it doesn't reflect decades of work, but that sort of spontaneity is a magical thing. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't, or it happens in different degrees. But a really good loose painting or a really good abstract or highly stylistic painting tends to have a common quality. I say tends to, because I don't like to speak in absolutes, but they tend to have the quality of looking like they just came into being. They just happened. Um, and I know uh, Mort's walking, watching, um, you know, his, his work is a great example of that. You know, and those of you who have had the privilege of watching him work at SKB or other workshops know that, you know, it's really magical the way Mort lets colors bleed and things move into each other and then pulls out from what that gives him um, you know, really exciting and interesting things that are evocative of the subject matter that he's eventually going to paint. And uh, that's a really magical process to watch. And it's, a you know, in a minor way, I'm sort of taking a page from that here, quite frankly, um, that um, I just want to be loose and free and open to what the materials give me and hopefully using them in a way that it really does suggest that this just kind of came into being. And having now done well over 20 of these, um, I think this will be the 25th or 6th, um, I can definitely attest to that. I mean, I'm happy with all of them for different reasons, but some of them are nice little studies of birds and others just have that kind of sublime, did I just do that kind of quality to it? And what's really fun about that is that, you know, when you ask yourself, did I just do that? The answer is yes, and I was also no is that you know there's that you did it but you also when you're in that sort of loose state and you 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 back off enough to let things happen i think it's very much like what writers talk about when they talk about their muse you know you allow for things to occur through you not just by you um and uh, that to me is um the joy of loosening up and it's why as difficult as it is for me to loosen up with what my personality is which is like a very serious type A personality. Um, why a lot of, you know, I mean, the, the whole process that I work in with the impasto and the building up and the standing down originally was to force me to loosen up. And over 20 years, I became so adept at that technique that now I can control it incredibly precisely. At which point you start thinking, well, okay, if the point was to use it to loosen up and now I can control it enough that it's actually a very rigorous technique, how do I loosen up now? You know, what do I do now to get out of my head, to get out of my um, thought process and just enjoy the medium and let, let the paint, let the pencil um, take over? Um, and, uh, you know, different artists of different stripes 
uh, have different varying degrees of difficulty with, with doing that. Um, but for me, um, it's legitimately quite hard um, to get out of my own way um, and, uh, and just let things happen. But that's what I'm trying to do with these studies. And I'd be curious to see because, you know, I'm enjoying this so much, I'm starting to wonder like, how is doing these very loose studies going to impact my more finished studio work? I don't know how to answer that right now, but I can guarantee you that it will. Um, and that again is the real value of experimentation. You know, the same way, you know, you find your signature style by trying a whole bunch of things and seeing what falls into place and what doesn't. Um, your signature style continues to evolve precisely because you don't close yourself off to experimentation. You allow yourself to keep experimenting, to keep being um, joyful and playful with what you do, um, however you approach that. And uh, that's how your work expands and moves on to the next phase of your style, of your career, what have you. So like all of us, I'm very much a work in progress. And um, like most works in progress, I don't know what the conclusion will be at all. But that's what makes it fun. So I'm getting pretty close to where I'm happy with this. And I think I just need to stop messing with it. Um, by the way, that's, uh, that's a good point that I always want to bring up. Um, there's an old saying I don't know who said it initially, maybe one of you will know, but uh, the difference between a good artist and a great artist is knowing when to stop, or the difference between a good piece of art and a great piece of art is knowing when to stop. Uh, it's very easy when you are working with something that's very free form like this to take it just one step past where it was brilliant, and then you go, eh, I did too much to it. Um, so I definitely want to uh, avoid getting to that point where I start feeling like I'm undoing what I just did. And I think I'm about there, almost. Let me just... I think I'm hearing somebody's news broadcast in there. I'm not sure who. Yeah, who's in Austin, Texas, or listening to someone talk about Austin, Texas? There we go. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, I think I think I'm gonna I'm gonna call that. Uh, he says while continuing to work. Uh, I think I'm calling call it quits. Maybe. Yep. Yep. I think I'm gonna call that good. Yeah, so um, turn the camera back around here. All right, so uh, that's, that's my little demo. Um, I'm uh, happy to hang around and chat for however long anybody wants if uh, they have any questions. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my presentation for today. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was Andrew, great. thank you very much. I got a lot out of it. Thank you so much. I'm glad. Andrew. Very it's good. Really <clears throat> it's really going to cheer up your friend, I think. Oh, I hope so. Thanks. <laughs> Pam, any closing yeah. words? Cardinal's amazing. Well, thank you, Andrew. Really appreciate, appreciate your time. And... Um, as a, a non-artist, I got a lot out of it, too. So not saying I could replicate it, but it was oh, very interesting. Well, thank you. It means a lot to me. You don't need to, you don't need to qualify that. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm so, very thrilled that you got something out of it. And, uh, well, and, and thanks, thanks so much to you and uh, David and Anthony and uh, everybody at SKB for, for setting these things up. I think, you know, uh, if you're at all like me, I mean, we artists tend to self-isolate anyway. And I think since this whole virus business started,